Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you've been with us in the last few sessions, you know that we've been studying the life of Christ. He's now in a, in a phase of his ministry where he's concentrating on his disciples. He's taken them way off up to Tyre and Sidon, come back down, went over to, to Judea and got chased out of there in a hurry. And uh, now we've come to a very special event that we find in Matthew 17. We'll start with verse 1. <coughs> and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. They were having a little trouble, though, weren't they, having, hearing him and what he was they saying? They were having more than a little trouble hearing what he had to say. That's right. Listen to him, you know, please. You can see, you know, we, we say God is omnipotent. And that means he can do anything, right? That's what the word is supposed to mean. But he can't make you love. Well, he refuses to violate your freedom. That's his character. Yeah. If he got his love, he couldn't. He, yeah. It just can't. If you're going to have love, you, four, can't, you can't. You can't tweak it to yeah. make it anything else. Yeah. So here's God, the Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit in heaven, Jesus here as a human being on this earth, and they're doing their utmost to convince these few disciples, and probably a few other followers as well, of the truths that were so important for their survival as a Christian group, and they're having a hard time. That's just amazing, amazing. Well, and Jesus, after spending this time with them, you know, the next thing they looked up and the cloud was gone and they went back down the mountain. What did Jesus say? Elijah is indeed coming first, answered Jesus, and he will get, I'm reading from verse 11, he will get everything ready. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and people do not recognize him, but treat him just as they pleased. In the same way, they will also mistreat the Son of Man. Then the disciples understood he was talking to them about Jesus. And talking when they returned to... The Baptist. What? Talking about John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptist. Yeah. Um, now, the one question I've got is, what do you think the whole purpose of the transfiguration is? Well, that's, that's a question I wanted to ask. What, any ideas? Well, I think there are multi-purposes. I don't yes. think there's just one. Yeah, okay. Well, give me a big one. I think, uh, I think God was there um, reassuring and encouraging Jesus. Yeah. And obviously watching very closely all the time. Mm -hmm. Jesus has been trying for years, and especially in the last six months now, to convince his disciples that he is God. But yet he wouldn't say it directly to them. Wouldn't he say said it to the Samaritan woman and a number of Gentiles, but he wouldn't say it to the disciples. Well, we, Hattie, at least I guess we don't he had have it by this time. But Whenever we, he said, I am, yeah. that gave the 
ruling class apoplexy. I mean, they, they, they were just uh, <laughs> yes. And several times he said, "We're coming to that in just a moment, a few minutes here." Yeah, exactly. Now, when Jesus said before that there would be some people here that would see him as a king, mm -hmm. is this is this the time this is right what here? he's talking about? Okay. So, I mean, what? What would you think if you were on the mountain with somebody and all of a sudden you look up and, you know, here's this incredible light and here's Jesus shining. I mean, and what do we know from statements that God made to Moses, etc., about what happens when God appears to somebody? Well, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Yes. And Jesus had to come and touch them and said, arise. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Then they looked up and saw that everything was normal. Yeah. But you can be sure they remembered this. Oh, oh, oh I should how did say. They, how did they know this was Moses and, and, and Elijah? The, the, the only possible way they could have known that was that God somehow identified them. Now, we would believe with our understanding of the nature of man and the fact that people when they die sleep in the grave, there are only three human beings that he could have potentially called up. The, the other one was Enoch. But and they knew their scriptures well yeah. enough to know this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if there were human beings with Jesus, now how did they know these were human beings and not angels? Now there's another question. And we're just not told. We don't know. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if they really looked like human mm -hmm. beings. And it, <clears throat> don't angels, for example, have wings? Wouldn't mm -hmm. they expect? Not necessarily, yeah. but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, who knows? They might have had a T-shirt on. One said Moses, and the other one said... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, moving on, when he got to the bottom of the hill, what did he find? One more thing, though. Okay. I, I think this was given for Jesus, too. Primarily. Because when he was, the Father was separating him in, Geth in Gethsemane, he had to depend on, on this, on the Father's... Uh, verbiage at his baptism mm -hmm. and his relationship in order to get through that thing. So I think this was a, a, a well, major thing for him. And, and let's, let's be specific. God had told Mo Moses that no human being can see me and live. No sinful human being can see me and live. The fact that Jesus was glorified there in their presence that they saw him, with that glory, proves that he was what? Sinless. Very important. It proves that Jesus was sinless and that he could have been taken to heaven right there. Yeah. He could live in God. talking about the time when they went into the cloud because the disciples were there and there's not even a record of them falling down where he had to get up to tell them to get up. Uh, yeah. So. Verse 8 says, uh, verse 7, get up, he said. Yeah, Jesus came to them and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. So they looked and saw no one was there but Jesus. They did fall down. Okay, so they did fall down. Yeah, which is what happened to all the people who God appeared to in the Old Testament. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And the message was always the same. Yeah. Get up, I want to talk to you. Yeah, exactly. But still, we have, we do have sinners in the presence of God there. Mm -hmm. unless, unless you're counting the cloud that goes over and covers well, them up. Jesus shone with this brilliant light. He himself shone with this brilliant light. Like Moses did when he came yeah. down from the mountain. Even maybe more so. Yeah. 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 So I, I think, that, I think that's, a, that's a proof. I think that Gary's asking, did the disciples see the glory of God? Uh, something yeah, that nobody is yeah. supposed to see and live. Yeah, I, I, I think they saw a glorified Christ. I don't think they saw the glory of God. Okay. Yeah, okay. Moving on, what happened at the bottom of the hill? Trouble. Trouble. Tell me more. There's always um, trouble at the bottom of the hill. Well, not just at the bottom <laughs> of the hill, but the disciples that hadn't gone up the mountain hadn't been able to heal the, heal the boy. And why not? Remember, these are the same disciples that have been given the power by Jesus to heal diseases, to cast out demons, to cleanse lepers, and to raise people from the dead. They had been given those powers to, to exercise traveling through Galilee. What's going wrong now? I think those other disciples were jealous mm -hmm. that, you know, they were always arguing who was the greatest. Yep. And then one morning, Jesus was gone, and three of the disciples were gone, and these others were still there. And I think that that had a lot to do with losing their power with God. 
because of the jealousy. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Was it that these that all the disciples had to learn that they needed connection with the Holy Spirit to do the miracles that they had done before? Yep. Why didn't Jesus take all of the disciples up there? Why just three? Because then that part of the story wouldn't have happened. Now that's also possible. <laughs> These three disciples did several things with Jesus. They were the ones who went to the Garden of Gethsemane with him. So they presumably, there's some evidence that James and John might have been Jesus' cousins. Maybe he felt a little closer to them for that reason. And John, there's lots of evidence that John was like very close to Jesus as a young man. Peter was a spokesman sort of for the group. Maybe that's why they got chosen. Well, it's interesting to see what happens next. We sometimes don't talk very much about this. Look at Matthew 17, starting with verse 24. What's going on here? When Jesus and his disciples came to Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked, does your teacher pay the temple tax? Of course, Peter answered. When Peter went into the house, Jesus spoke up first. Simon, what is your opinion? Who pays duties or taxes to the kings of this world? The citizens of the country or the foreigners? The foreigners, answered Peter. Well then, replied Jesus, that means that the citizens don't have to pay. But we don't want to offend these people, so go to the lake, drop in a line. Now, how was Peter used to fishing in the lake? With nets. With nets and boats at nighttime, right? Go to the lake, drop in a line, pull up the first fish you hook, and in its mouth you will find a coin worth enough for my temple tax and yours. Take it. <laughs> and pay them our taxes. What was going on here? I don't think Peter was thinking this out when he made his first answer. Because when, when he says yes, he, paid, he probably was thinking, well, he's trying to keep from tr having trouble get stirred up. But okay. he was telling them that Jesus was a foreigner, that Jesus wasn't really supposed to be there. You know, he, okay, well, as usual, this was a trap yes. set by the Pharisees. Yeah. And what was the trap? If you say, I pay the temple tax, I'm saying I didn't, I'm not a prophet. Mm -hmm. I'm not a miracle worker, I'm probably not a rabbi. Or, or priest. Mm -hmm. If I don't pay the temple tax, then I'm ignoring the rules. Yeah, and I, I'm not loyal to the, to the system. Yeah. Right. You think yeah, they've been paying, the disciples have been paying the tax up to now? Probably. <coughs> Excuse me. Think Jesus did? No. Because prophets didn't weren't required. It, it yeah. says that clearly in the yeah. Old Testament. It, it says here a slightly different slant than your American standard. It says he did not want to offend them. Mm -hmm. So they paid it anyway. Well, Ellen White has these words. I'm reading from Desire of Ages, page 433. In the days of Christ, the priests and Levites were still regarded as especially devoted to the temple and were not required to make the annual contribution for its support. Prophets also were setting aside his claim as a prophet, I'm sorry, were exempted from this payment. In requiring the tribute from Jesus, the rabbis were setting aside his claim as a prophet or teacher, rabbi, and were dealing with him as any commonplace person. A refusal on his part to pay the tribute would be represented as disloyalty to the temple, while on the other hand, a payment of it would be taken as justifying their rejection of him as a prophet. Now, Considering what happened, how did it come out? Well, how often can you just go out and <coughs> tell a guy to pick up a fish out, randomly out of the lake and there'll be a coin in there to pay it? I mean, just having that happen just makes everything moot. Is it this proved, used it in, proved, I'm sorry. Well, no. I'm just thinking that Jesus used, again, lemons and made lemonade out of it, made the <laughs> best opportunity for teaching. Yeah. So if anybody says, well, did Jesus pay the tax? Yeah, let me tell you how he paid it. <laughs> well, he also, he also performed a miracle to prove that he was a prophet. Yes, exactly. And what example did he have for Peter? Yeah, you know, exactly. Peter learned a lot. Pay attention just, when, yeah. before you open your mouth, right? <laughs> before you fall into that trap again, think. <laughs> well, what happens next in the life of Jesus? We come to a nec another major... Uh, point, another major uh, transition in the life of Christ. It's um, the fall of A.D. 30. It's six months away from the crucifixion. And Jesus' uh, uh, his uh, brothers come to him. And we read about it in John chapter 2. Look over at John chapter 2. Verse 
I'm, I'm sorry, John 7, verse 2. After this, Jesus traveled in Galilee. He did not want to travel in Judea because the Jewish authorities there were wanting to kill him. Let's be very clear about that. The time for the Festival of Shelters was near. The Festival of Shelters is Feast of otherwise sometimes called the Feast of Tabernacles. It occurred about what time in the year? In the year? Springtime. No, this is a fall festival, late September, maybe early October, somewhere along in there. Um, so Jesus' brother said to him, and this is a very important verse for us understanding what was going on in the family of Jesus. In Oriental cultures, younger brothers don't tell older brothers what to do. So this tells us that these brothers were what relationship to Jesus in terms of age? Older. They were older. Therefore, they were not children of Mary. Mary. They were children of Joseph, Joseph presumably I uh, obviously by, an, uh, by a previous wife. Okay? So Jesus' brother said to him, Leave this place and go to Judea so that your followers will see the things that you are doing. People don't hide when they are what they are doing if they want to be well known. Since you are doing these things, let the whole world know about you. Not even his brothers believed in him. So how did Jesus respond? Jesus said to them, The right time for me has not yet come. Now, some people could say, well, wow, how, what's going on here? Because just a short time later, he went ahead and went up there. When Jesus repeatedly in his ministry, if you look carefully through and you compare the verses, Jesus always refers to my right time as the time when he's going to go up and be killed. So this is not talking about my time to go up is not yet. He's talking about my time to be killed. My time to go for the final trip to Jerusalem has not yet come. Any time is right for you. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I keep telling it that its ways are bad. You go on to the festival. I'm not going to this festival because the right time has not come for me. He said this and then stayed on in Galilee. Now, you need to understand another couple of points. What, ha what, what happened when there were three major festivals held in Jerusalem every year? And when it was about time for the festival to begin, one of these festivals, what happened? Groups traveled. Huge groups would get together and they would travel. This was the social, these were the social occasions of the year. Huge groups would get together and they would travel down to Jerusalem as large groups, meeting with their friends and talking. And, you know, they, they didn't have to take care of their flocks and their gardens and their everything. This was a great social occasion. So they're traveling and Jesus says, no, that's not the way I'm going to go to Jerusalem. <coughs> because if he had done that, what do you think might have happened? They'd have got him. Well, there would have been some people rushing ahead saying, guess what, Jesus is coming, it's time to make him king. Yeah. And the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have heard about it and they would sure have arrested him somehow or other. Yeah. So what does Jesus do? After, verse 10, after his brothers had gone to the festival, he, Jesus also went. However, he did not go up openly, but secretly. The Jewish authorities were looking for him at the festival. Where is he, they asked. Now remember, he has not been in Jerusalem for a year and a half. There was much whispering about him in the crowd. He is a good man, some people said. No other said he, he fools the people. But no one talked about him openly because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. The festival was nearly half over when Jesus went to the temple and began teaching. Now again, we need to understand the, what's going on here. What, what is, what's Jesus doing? How did, he, how did he manage? I mean, if, if the authorities are trying to kill you and they're in charge of the temple, do you just march right into the temple and start teaching? Well, the, uh, the fellow online has a comment. Mm -hmm. He says, it makes one wonder what kind of teaching were they getting before he came? And that's why Jesus came, is to, to change their, their th picture. Yeah, what they, exactly. Uh, and the hard part of the teaching is to get through that yeah. maze of material that, you, that you've been... Uh, raised with yeah okay so well, what was happening here what what's the what's the context here how does jesus manage to walk into the temple and, and he's not arrested he's not killed there are so many people there that the authorities are afraid to arrest him so many people want to hear want to see jesus want to be healed want to listen to what he has to say the authorities are afraid to touch him so jesus shows up early in the day before, sort of almost sneaks into the temple and suddenly people, crowds realize he's there. 
There they are before the authorities have a chance to do anything. And Jesus does this several times. Very interesting. So he kind of snuck in there and popped up all of a sudden with all these people. Well, as soon as the people heard him, they're... Whoosh. Right, right. So, hmm. So and this, the, 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 the authorities don't dare to arrest him because they know that the, there would be a huge reaction among the people. So what do they want to do? What, what is their goal in approaching Jesus at this point in time? Trap again. Okay, trap. trap. What is, but what do they want to accomplish by their traps? Discredit, discredit him. They want to discredit him, and then they want to use that discredit in whatever form they could to, to, to be an excuse to eliminate him. Yeah. Exactly. Very good. Very good. So what happened? Some of the people, look at verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem said, isn't this the man the authorities are trying to kill? Look, he's talking in public and they say nothing against it. Can it be that they really know that he is the Messiah? Notice how their efforts here are turning against them. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from, we all, and we all know where this man comes from. Now, this is a very important point. Let me read on another couple of verses, and let's see what, what we learn from this. As Jesus taught in the temple, he said in a loud voice, Do you really know me and know where I, come, I am from? I have not come on my own authority. He who sent me, however, is truthful. You do not know him, but I know him, because I came from him, and he sent me. Then they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Now, we talked about that a moment ago. But many in the crowd believed in him and said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more miracles than this man has? has? And so what we see here is that the, 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 the Jewish authorities taught that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Why did they say that? It was prophesied. Too. Prophesied, Micah 5, 2. Yeah, so they believed that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They would somehow disappear. They didn't know where he would go to. And then he would return as an adult, ready to lead their armies against the Romans and against everybody else, I guess, for that matter, until they conquered the world. That's what they expected. You know, for him to sort of r ride into town on a white steed, you know, the old king routine. Sounds kind of like he's raptured and then comes back. Yeah, almost, doesn't it? So what happens next? And anything that didn't fit into that just did not compute. Yeah. Yeah, they, they wouldn't allow themselves even to think about it. Right. Well, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering these things about Jesus, so they, they and the chief priests sent some guards to arrest him. Where, where did you get this information that this is what they believed? Well, uh, it's based on, on this stuff here in John 7. This is the best... Now, this, 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 what they believed was that We'd the Messiah was, was, was going to be born in Bethlehem, and he's going to disappear, and then he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it talks about that. Um, if, if you... But others, well, look at verse 40. Some of the people in the crowd heard him say this and said, this man is really the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. But others said, the Messiah will, come from, will not come from Galilee. The scriptures say that the Messiah will be a descendant of King David and will be born of Bethlehem, the town where David lived. So there was a division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. So clearly, they didn't know where he was, had been born. He was, he was born in Bethlehem. They didn't realize the prophecy about Nazarene, the Nazarene. And they, you know, he's from Galilee. So they misunderstood those prophecies. So he was a, one of the things the leadership was concerned about was that he was a threat to this concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was absolutely, yeah. What it, about, my, what it amounted to is that if they accepted Jesus, they would have to give up all their cherished dreams of, future world domination, and they were not willing to give up those dreams. Yeah, pretty sad, really, very sad. So what happens next? The woman, 7.53. Okay, we come, we come to, to John 8, and we'll notice now that for the next Several events were going right through the Gospel of John, and there's nothing about these events in other, other, other Gospels. Why is that? Well, they were left out, and John thought it was time to put them in. <laughs> Why were they left out? They were left out because they were so controversial that these topics, if they had been written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
they would have, uh, the authorities, the Jewish authorities would have... Might have destroyed those writings. Yeah. Possibly. That's one theory. That's one possibility. Well, there's uh, probably been a lot of things left out, even now. Oh, yeah. I Clearly. mean, they said at the end of the, what, John? That mm -hmm. um, yeah. all the books sure. couldn't fill up the whole world, you know, yeah. what Jesus had done. Yeah. Yeah. But well, wasn't John written afterwards? John was written at least 30 years after the other Gospels. So this is based on interviews that somebody went through and... Um, Interviews? No, that might have been Luke. You're more thinking more about Luke. John when he, was written by John. John was written by John, and he was the closest disciple. Probably the last you book mean that you was don't think, You don't think... No, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and this was written probably... The book of John was probably written after Jerusalem was destroyed, yeah, so we don't have to worry ago. about the temple and the Jewish system anymore. Yeah, it was written and at least 20 years ago. You don't think there would be any interviews as far as... You think that, it all came from John? Yeah. I mean... Yeah. This is written by John himself. Written by John. Yeah. First, first hand witness. Yeah. And he had Mark's story well, he, already. I'm sure that, 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 that John was aware of the other, of the other gospels that had been written. Now this, we've already mentioned, but let me just say it again. Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus almost all their gospel, except for the final, focus on the final week of, of the Pass Passover week. They, they focus on the ministry in Galilee exclusively, almost exclusively, not 100% exclusive, but almost exclusively. John focuses on what happens in Jerusalem. Almost the entire book of John is, he, he completely skips the ministry in, in Galilee. Clearly, he must have figured that the other gospel writers had covered that. And he talks about what happens in Jerusalem. So that's what we want to really, that's what's really going on here in, in, in John. So we come to John 8, one of the most famous stories from the life of Jesus. It says, Then everyone went to home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery. They made her stand before them all. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, G Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death. Now what do you say? They said this to trap Jesus so that they could accuse him. But he bent over and wrote on the ground with his finger. As they stood there answer asking him questions, he straightened up and said to them, Whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on, wrote on the ground. When they heard this, they all left one by one, the older ones first. Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened up and said to her, Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir, she answered. Well then, Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, but do not sin again. Now this is an incredible story. There are several things that we need to observe about the story. First, first of all, the, the, the law about committing adultery is that the husband, well, the two, both parties committing adultery were supposed to be brought together. So immediately we recognize that the Pharisees and the scribes, the Sadducees involved here, were not following the rules. They only brought the woman. And they only brought the woman. And what was their goal? Well, to trap him. To trap, trap him. Jesus, yes. Why, what, what was the trap? If Jesus said, throw stones at her, they would have accused him of breaking the Roman law, which said only Romans are allowed to put someone to death. If he said, don't throw stones at her, he, they would say, you're, you're breaking the law of Moses. It says that people like this are supposed to be stoned. They thought they had an airtight case. And what did Jesus do? Did he break anybody's rules? Did he break anybody's laws? Well, you have to stick around to find out the answer.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay with us. Let's look at this story in a little more depth, if you will. Um, Jesus recognized all this stuff. He was writing, he could have done several things. First of all, he knew perfectly well what was going on. His divine uh, insight, or even perhaps his father telling him, he knew exactly what was going on. Now, he knew that those people who brought the woman were real scoundrels. They weren't trying to, they weren't trying to you know, uphold the laws of Moses at all. The, the man, whoever he was, wasn't brought at all. They weren't even trying to follow the rules. It was probably one of them. Probably one of them. Which brings us to the next question. What was Jesus doing? You know, he could have said, you bunch of sinners, I'm going to write your, 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 your sins on the, on the wall, the stone walls of this temple. And they will be permanently recorded there. He could have done that. Oh, absolutely. But did he? No. no. Even with those scoundrels, he wrote his... In the sand. In the sand or in the dust, probably the dust yeah. on the floor of the temple. Where it would go away. And a few puffs of wind or a few footsteps and they would be gone. But the fact that they left one by one, beginning with the eldest, tells you what? They're looking over his shoulder, right, watching. And they beat him. When they saw what was written on the street, you know, who knows? Maybe some of them had been with this same woman. Who knows? But Jesus wrote something on there, and they knew very well that he understand un dates and places. Dates and Date <laughs> place. Date <laughs> place. <laughs> Who knows? But they certainly. Even the high priest had a rope tied around him when he went into the holy of holies. So yeah. everyone has sin. Mm -hmm. So whoever has the first, whoever has no sin, go ahead, throw the first stone. So who was the he only trapped one? them. Who was the only one who was really qualified to throw Jesus. a stone? Jesus. Yeah. He didn't even mention about the fact that the other guy wasn't there. Yeah. He didn't even mention that. Yeah. But I think this is a, a, a marvelous thing. Neither do I condemn thee. Mm -hmm. If ever there was the dispensation of grace handed to a person, that's it. Yeah. But the next phrase go and sin no more. Yeah. How would she know if she was sinning if she didn't have a law? Yeah. So here's the absolute union of grace and law. You can put together some comments from Ellen White that we as Seventh-day Adventists hold up as, as being inspired. Um, you can put together some comments that she made suggesting that this woman may have been Mary Magdalene. Uh, we don't have time to review all those quotes right now. But she does say, after commenting on this story, says, this woman went away after this wonderful, this incredible experience and became one of his most devoted followers because of what Jesus had done for her on that occasion. For good reason. Yeah, for good reason. Under normal circumstances, she would be dead. I and mean, this had been anybody else other than Jesus. And she knew it. Now, there's another interesting thing about this story that we, we should mention, I think. If, if you have one of the modern translations, you'll see that the story I read is in brackets, or in some versions, it's even in the footnote. And if you, if you are familiar with some of the older manuscripts, you'll find out that some have it here, some have it there, some have it, some even put it over in Luke, as it's not even John, it's in Luke. Does that mean that this is not a valid story, maybe? That's what some have said. Some have suggested that. Why do you suppose it's in all those different places? Because it was popular. It was a thing that people who were writing remembered and wanted to put in there. Well, I don't know about the popular <laughs> part, but it they recognized that this was an absolutely incredible story. That's right. And what you could say is this, the down through the ages, these the Bible was copied by a bunch of uh, monks in monasteries and things like that over through the Dark Ages. You could, you could guarantee you, yourself that this story was not invented by them. Absolutely. Right. No <laughs> such story would be a chauvinistic men that wrote, that copied the Bible down through the ages. That's yes. what you're saying. Yes, exactly. Male chauvinists. So even though, even though this story, we're, we're not even sure where it belongs in the documents, there is no question that nobody, nobody would have invented such a story. It has to be a true story. 
No human being would have possibly dreamed up such a story. So, then begins a very, very interesting discussion that we need to look at. Um, Jesus says, he spoke to the Pharisees now after their condemnation, verse 12 in, in John 8. I am the light of the world, he said. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. The Pharisees said to him, now you are testifying on your own behalf. What you say proves nothing. No, Jesus answered, and even though I do testify on my own behalf, what I say is true because I know where I came from and where I'm going. And I'm not going to, this is a little bit repetitious down to, through verse 20, but I want to go to verse 21 and following. And again, Jesus said to them, I will go away. You will look for me, but you will die in your sins. You cannot go where I am going. So the Jewish authority said, he all, he says that we cannot go where he is going. Does this man mean that he will kill himself? Jesus answered, you belong to this world here below, but I come from above. You're from this world, but I'm not from this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. And you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Does that ring any bells with anybody? Yes, yes that's the I am the I am. I am who I am. Sounds like what God said to Moses. Okay. Who shall I say sent me? I tell them I am. Okay. The Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, who is the best pronunciation we know in, in, in modern times, the, that tetragrammaton is sometimes called four letters. Um, the Jews considered that name to be too sacred to even pronounce. If you were reading along the Bible and you come to that name, you do not pronounce Yahweh, you pronounce Adonai, because that's, Adonai is a word for Lord. So instead of saying God or, or Yahweh, you would say Adonai, Lord, because they consider that name too sacred. It's the, it was, it, to the Jew, this is the personal name of God. That's what it is. Now, Jesus is, Jesus is speaking Aramaic here. We don't have the Aramaic. We, we, what we have is Greek, but the Greek, ego and me, is the direct translation of the Hebrew Yahweh. So Jesus is talking along and all of a sudden he says, I am. Now remember that the word, the word Yahweh means, it's a verb. It means something like to be. That's why it's sometimes translated the eternal one or the everlasting one or I am who I am or, or I will be who I will be. You know, all those kind of, it's, it's a, there's no time to it, but it's still a verb. So Jesus uses the word, and the, and, the, and the Pharisees don't catch it. So who are you, they asked him. Jesus answered, what, what I have told you from the very beginning. I have much to say about you, much to condemn you for, etc., etc. Drop down to verse 27. They did not understand that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. So he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Again, he says it. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And he who, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Many who heard Jesus say these things believed in him. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you obey my teaching, you, will, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. A very significant verse. We are the descendants of Abraham, they answered, and we have never been anybody's slaves. What do you mean then by saying you will be free? True or not true? Where did they get their history from? <laughs> Where did they get their history from? Were they ever in Egypt? Yeah. Were they ever in Babylon? Were they now under Roman rule? Anyway. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. So he's talking about real slavery here. And I wish I had time to read the whole thing. Um, but they, he says, you know, you don't even know God. And they said, God is our father, the only father we have. Drop down to verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God really were your father, you would love me because I came from God and now I am here. I did not come to you... Uh, come on my own authority, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to listen 
to my message. In other words, you can't, you can't accept what I'm saying to you. You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. What do you suppose Jesus' vo voice sounded like when he said those words? Sad. Well, you can only imagine. But you could... Those you could, are his children. But you could, yes. you, could, you could repeat those in anger, and you could sound like you had the hair on the back of your neck raising up. Or you could repeat those words with tears in your eyes. Well, their response is verse 48. They, they asked Jesus, Were we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon in you? Mm -hmm. So both sides now are saying the other side is demon-possessed, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus goes on, and I wish I had time to read the whole, all the verses, but you need to drop down um, to verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced, and this is Jesus speaking, your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. They said to him, you are not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied. And now he says it in a way you can't possibly miss it. Before Abraham was born, I am. And what was their response? Get a stone. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. So, they start out with plans to stone a woman, and they end up with plans to stone Jesus. Yeah. Plans to stone God. Plans to stone God. Yeah. So and these are the church leaders doing mm -hmm. this. These are church leaders, yeah. Um, what do you make of verse 32? I think we ought to come back to that for just a minute. What is Jesus trying to say? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Could that have anything to do with us? Sure. Well, we're pretty tangled up with a lot of lies. Mm -hmm. The lies well, kind of are are binding. Mm -hmm. Isn't this another way where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. If you know me, mm -hmm. the truth, I can make you free. Yes. Free from what? Free from sin. Slavery to sin. And the only way to be free from the slavery of sin is to know the truth about God. And that's also eternal life. Yeah. Which Jesus no, said elsewhere. No the Father and the Son. Yeah. Not yeah. only the truth about, but know God. Yeah. 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 Become yeah. intimate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So this was an incredible experience. Now Jesus is six months away from crucifixion, and is he winning popularity contests with the authorities in Jerusalem? Not quite. Oh, Not really. <laughs> Not really. But why is he doing this? Do you think the disciples were there listening to all of this? Why would he, what's he trying to accomplish? Some of it is being recorded for us. Yes. The disciples were hearing this and recording it for us and our associates. Okay. But there's a very important reason why they needed to hear it too. Also, the disciples are building up their faith by seeing that the authorities are not arresting Jesus. Mm -hmm. They keep trying to deceive him and catch him in something, but Jesus says the right thing every time. But we learned a lesson in our last, uh, last week's discussion that we need to come back to here. What was that? Do you remember? These disciples, as typical Jews, had grown up with the idea that the scribes and the Pharisees were one step away from being God themselves. What they said was the absolute truth. Nobody could question of it, question it. They were the ones who could read the scripture. The disciples couldn't read Aramaic, probably. I mean, couldn't read Hebrew, probably. Very unlikely they could read. They knew some verses. They had maybe memorized some in, in the schools, in, in the synagogues or whatever. But when the, when the authorities spoke, that was the word of God, as far as they were concerned. And Jesus is saying, look, we just came from being among the Gentiles. 
You saw how they welcomed us. We come over here and everybody's accusing us. They're trying to do everything possible. They're trying to kill me. Not only that, they're calling me a son of the devil. And the disciples, I'm, I'm sure it was tough for them because here is, here, here is their leader facing the people they believe are speaking the word of God. And what do you do? Well, and he says, your God has a devil. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, wanting, they're wanting him to go beat up on the Romans themselves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're well, I mean, this is what the authorities had said, mm -hmm. and they, had, they believed it. I mean, they were hoping for that themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's, if he's the next king, then maybe I can be prime minister. Right? Well, there were a couple of stories where some fellows even tried to jockey themselves into that position. Yeah. So are you asking, why did Jesus attack these authorities? <coughs> Is that what you're asking? Well, I'm, I'm asking, what, what, yeah, that's basically what I'm asking. Yeah, why, why this conversation? I mean, Jesus goes out there, and it, it seems like in his early part of his life, up until this last six months, he, he, he sort of tries to stay out of conflict. And now he's just, he's hitting it head on. He's just walking into the lion's den and just saying, boom. Why the change? He's trying to change the paradigm of the disciples and the whole nation and us. Well, the, I would venture to say that uh, the disciples are now trained. They're ready to... Uh, head into battle. Think so? And, and especially if you ask Peter. <laughs> yeah, he's got his sword <laughs> ready, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're as good as it's going to get before they head into battle. It's time to, whether, whether, whether they're completely trained or not, it's now time to, to come in and confront uh, this erroneous understanding about God and about what we are to be like if we're if we're godly. You okay. know, if Jesus if Jesus could let the air out of this authority, mm -hmm. the people if they saw the air going out of the authority, mm -hmm. what would turn around would be that hey, I got to make some personal decisions here. This isn't mm -hmm. I can't rely on these guys anymore. Yeah, and exactly. That's kind of what he was doing. Yeah. He never lost an opportunity to cut to the quick, and it also yeah. says there, and many people decided to believe. Yeah, exactly. Some got the message. Yeah, exactly. They may not have come out and been public with it for the next six months, but right. then after the resurrection, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, they came out in crowds. Yeah. yeah. Well, why, why were 3,000 converted in one day? Exactly. There were many people uh, disenfranchised with the leadership. Uh, yeah. All he needed was some evidence, some proof. Yeah, yeah. And here was Jesus providing it. Mm -hmm. Jesus was providing. And all of this happened where again? In the temple. In the temple. And who was supposed to be in charge of everything that went on in the temple? Sadducees. The Sadducees especially, but the, the, the church authorities for sure. The high priest. The high priest officially, yeah. But this was also another prophecy that was being fulfilled, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. That this this temple would have something greater than Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens next? Well, we don't have to look at the other the other three gospels, do we? You have to go along to John next. Look at Jesus heals a man born blind. The head, heading says on my Bible, as Jesus was walking along. Now, where, where are we in, in sequence? It's six months before Passover weekend. Jesus is still at the Feast of Tabernacles. He's in Jerusalem. He's walking along. He saw a man who'd been born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his, his own or his parents' sin? Now, here's a good, another excellent example of Jewish thinking. What, what's, what's the Jewish thinking going on here? You're blessed if you're good, you're cursed if you're bad. And he was obviously cursed. Yeah. If you're cursed, you'll be poor. Yeah. If you're cursed, you'll be sick. Sick. Maimed. Yeah. yeah. If you're blessed, you'll be healthy and wealthy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Jesus answered, his blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. 
He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground. We've talked about spittle before, or saliva. Spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and told him, Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This, this name means sent. So the man went, washed his face, and came back seeing. Now, that's no problem. Everybody should have been rejoicing, right? Amen. What, what, what um, was this man's circumstance special and unique? I mean, aren't there, isn't there misconduct on the part of parents that can actually create blindness in their children? Is he, is he saying here that um, your your the your behavior has no effect on 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 your children or your offspring? That well, that that would be. That's if he was actually if he was literally born blind, then I mean there's several possibilities. Uh, one possibility was that he got an eye infection at the, at the po in the process of being born, and he got blind from that. I, we used to have a pastor in Africa that, worked, that I worked with uh, that was blind because he got measles when he was very, very young. And the witch doctor told his mom to make this, this brew out of the roots of a tree. And she stuck it in his eyes, and he was blind from the rest of his life. So maybe, but it says he was born blind. So I'm going to take that to mean literally he was born blind. So either he was, had a congenital defect with his eyes or maybe something in the birth process, we have to assume. Anyway, the point is the guy had not been able to see since the, since the point when he was born. Now, that means that he is really blind, okay? There's, nobody's been able to do anything about this, and he's going he's to mention that here a little bit later. So what happened? Well, his neighbors then and the people who had seen him begging before this asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some, some said, he's the one, but others said, no, he isn't. He, he just looks like him. I mean, this man was going around with a beam on his face. He was smiling so big and so happy that they weren't sure that it was the same guy. So the man himself said, I am the man. So, the man, uh, so how is that that you can now see, they asked him. He answered, the man who called Jesus made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash my face. So I went, and as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he, they asked. I don't know, he answered. Then they took, the, took to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. The day that Jesus made the mud and cured him of his blindness was a Sabbath. Oh, dear. Now we got a big problem. What's the problem? Well, Jesus working. is doing good on the Sabbath. He's working. <laughs> he's have that, he's right? doing all he's kinds working. of work. He's making medicine. He's applying it. He's mixing it up. You know, spit in the mud. He mixes up the mud. That's kneading. That's a kind of kneading. He's putting it on the man's eyes. It was, they were forbidden to put any medicine on above the neck. He's putting on a strange medicine. In, some, in a few exceptions, you could use medicine on your head or on the rest of your body on Sabbath if it was something you did all the time. This was not something that he did all the time. This was completely strange. Jesus broke a whole collection of rules by doing this on the Sabbath. Now, this was obviously an emergency situation, right? Yeah. 30, how long had he been born? 38 <laughs> years? Yeah. Whatever. I know, I know this isn't the guy that was 38 years, but he'd been, he'd been dead. He'd been blind his whole life. Long, long time. It's interesting to note, though, earlier in the areas where we were at the beginning, it was legal to circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Yeah. That was okay. And yeah. Christ has then said, and yet you're on me because I healed this whole man right by me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And they never, they never let up. They kept coming at him. The point so, is, though, that... that this obviously came from God, mm -hmm. and yet it, it got so far off that they didn't even recognize that anymore. They just saw him as doing it on the Sabbath. Well, and, and, but notice the discussion. The, the, you, you can just see the, the Pharisees are just tearing their hair out. They're, they're tied up in knots, and they just don't even know where to go next. The Pharisees then asked the man a, a, again how he had received his sight. He told them, he put some mud on my eyes. I washed my face, and now I can see it. Can't you get that through your heads? 
Some of the Pharisees said, the man who did this cannot be from God, for he does not obey the Sabbath law. He says he's uh, a sinner. I like the, the commentary. He says, he answered, well, he is a sinner. I do not know. One thing I know for sure, <laughs> I was blind and now I see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just this elementary. And others, however, <laughs> said, how could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? And there was a division among them. So the Pharisees asked the man once again, you say you be, he, he cured you of your blindness? Well, what did, he, what did you say about him? He's a prophet, the man answered. The Jewish authorities, however, were not willing to believe that he had been blind and could now see until they called his parents and asked them, is this your son? You say that he was born blind. How is it then that he can now see? His parents answered, and of course, they're, they're afraid of the authorities. You know, he's, he's an adult man, and this is an important part of the story, you know. He's an adult man. He can answer for himself. I got a question. Yeah. I want to, we're, we're about out of time. Okay. The Bible says that Jesus is love. God is love. Mm -hmm. We've been looking at a whole lot of stories and events. How do these events add or detract from that concept? Okay, fair enough. And in the few a minute or so we've got left, let's, let's talk about that. Several things. One, I believe that Jesus has demonstrated that he's obviously a miracle working person. Yeah. He has the power of God. He is God. He says so. Two, he, heals, he, he, does, he goes out of his way to do wonderful things for people. God reaches us where we are. I think that's what that says. Three, the Jews had, and, and I have some Jewish friends that I love them and all that kind of stuff, but they had really messed things up here. And, and Jesus is doing everything he possibly can to to convince his disciples especially, but everybody, that the, the way they had been teaching was wrong. They needed to disabuse themselves of these notions that somehow or other he as a Messiah is going to come and help them conquer the Romans. There's really, really, really important information for them to see. And Jesus is getting ready now to say, look, I want as many people as possible to focus on me because the most important event of my life is coming up in a few months. And I want to get as many people's attention as I can so you will be there and you'll be watching and you'll ask the right questions when that day comes. See you again next week.